Good afternoon, everybody, and good evening. And depending where you are in the world, it might even be morning or night. Welcome to you all to this uh, webinar, which is the part of our campaign for World Shogun's Day. My name is Linda Stone. I am chairman of the British Shogun Syndrome Association and secretary of Shogun Europe. And they are joint sponsors of this particular webinar. The focus for World Shogun's Day this year on the 23rd of July is the eye, which is very important to all of us who are living with shoguns. I'm some housekeeping arrangements for you. The webinar is being recorded and will be available at some point uh, in the near future on the Shogun Europe website and on our other social media. If you want to ask a question, please put it in the box marked Q&A. If you want to chat amongst yourselves, then by all means use the chat icon. But if you put a question in the chat icon, it might not be picked up for, the, for questions and answers, okay? It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Mr. Anka Barua, who is a consultant ophthalmologist based in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. He has a specialist interest in corneal anterior segment and refractive surgery, and he's director of corneal services at BMEC. He has a very impressive background uh, in terms of fellowships and consultant posts and other roles, including being a council member of the British Contact Lens Association from 2020 and a Global Education and Research Society of Ophthalmology, the young young youth officer chair, I guess it is, from 2020 to present. And, the, uh, and he's also a designated individual uh, on the Human Tissue Authority for BMEC. And, and all... ...active course. And in addition to this, he's active in research. He treats patients both in the National Health Service and privately and uh, is, as I say, a specialist in dry, in the surface of the eye, which is what we're particularly interested in with living with Shogun's. So can I hand it over to you, please, Anka, to Thank you, Linda. educate Thanks. us with your wisdom. Thank, Thank you, very, you for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'll just start off by sharing my screen and please let me know if um, you can see it. So, um, I'd like to welcome all of you. I've heard on the chat box that I'm competing with the last English player in Wimbledon, so I'll try and beat that. So as Linda's already um, introduced me, I'm not going to uh, talk about any of my, my bits. I'm going to go straight to the crux of the matter, which is what you've all come on here for, which is to find out more about what's happening with dry eye, especially in Chagrin specifically. I'm going to talk about dry eye in specific all the things that are coming out and what, what I'm doing at the moment with patients who have this um, uh, kind of severe debilitating condition for some, um, if not most. So let me move on. So just to give you a brief history of where I've been and what I've done, um, QVH in East Grinstead is where I did my fellowship. And um, I learned a lot about dry eye management there. Uh, and furthermore, I uh, even, learned about techniques for treating dry eye surgically, which I'm going to talk about briefly today as well. I also did most of my training, uh, sorry, I did uh, a, a consultant post in Chelsea Westminster as well, and I was in MREH as a trainee. So I, I, I've had quite a bit of experience in different places, and I was in Coventry until recently, and then I moved to BMEC, which is where I am now. So I've been all around the country pre pretty much, and um, I've been able to learn from uh, consultants who've been my bosses in the past and uh, people who I learn from every day. I, I'm still learning from patients every single day. I'm sorry I'm in my scrubs today. I've just finished theatre. Um, I, I did have a suit in my locker, but I didn't think I had time to change. Um, uh, these are my financial disclosures. So all of these financial disclosures are just for educational roles. So I'm not a key opinion leader. I don't you know, I'm, I'm just I'm just doing educational events for trainees, other doctors, GPs, opticians, optometrists, and um, I've had a lot of support from companies to do this. So um, I, I have to have this slide uh, to disclose that. 
So just as a brief overview to all of you, what does a corneal unit do? So we're seen by other ophthalmologists as the window cleaner. So this is the cornea, as you all know. So the cornea is the front part um, of the eye. It's a clear, transparent part. And then you see the iris and the pupil behind. Um, I'm involved in corneal transplantation. We've done, I did two transplants today, one in a six week old and one in a uh, 35 year old. So there's a wide range of thing, uh, uh, of people that we treat from very young to very old. Um, but the main thing in relation to ocular surface is that we do a lot of stuff for ocular surface, both from the medical point of view and from the surgical point of view. Um, and that includes dealing with cataract surgery in patients who have um, ocular surface disease. Um, we also deal with dystrophies and conjunctival disease. I'm going to speak a little bit about that as well. Um, and obviously uh, things that are a bit more suspicious, such as neoplasia and inflammatory disease. So this is the patient journey. The reason why we have patients coming to speak to us or come to see us is simply because their daily activities are affected. So, for example, work, they have fear that they have a serious eye problem that needs managing and they have... Okay. We have general practitioners, which is a primary care, and the primary care service is very, very good. Um, they're like the jack of all trades. So, for example, my dad's a GP, and I know how, what GPs go through. I have no criticism at all of GPs, but they're not the specialists in each area. It's impossible to be a specialist in every area. So GPs are very good at doing the basics in terms of giving basic eye treatment. But when there's no effect to these medications, often they're referred to somebody like me for management. They're often advised by the pharmacists, by opticians. We get a lot of referrals from optometrists and opticians for eye conditions. So in addition to the GP side of things, we get optometrists referring to it as well. And then systemic disease. So we've had a question already about what we do with systemic disease um, in terms of um, uh, how we manage oral uh, kind of treatment for Sjogren's and how we monitor the side effects. And I'm gonna talk briefly about that as well. And any questions that you have, please ask. I'm happy to stop at any point. Um, I think somebody else is monitoring the questions because I won't be able to see them just at the moment. So what exactly is ocular surface disease? So often we talk about dry eye, but actually dry eye is an umbrella term for many things that may not be understood to us as dry eye. So we tend to use the umbrella term ocular surface disease. So anything that's affecting the surface of the eye, the tear film, the conjunctiva, which is the white, the transparent film over the white part of the eye, the cornea, which is the window into eye, which I've already mentioned. There's so many conditions that affect that whole unit. Just think of the unit as, for example, in a car, you get the windscreen wipers, you get the uh, windscreen washers, um, you get the window itself, which has to maintain its clarity. So all of these help manage conditions. For example, weather conditions, when you're driving the car, you have to put your wiper blades on. If you have dust or sand or grit, you have to spray that away. So think of the eye as, um, or the, the, the area around the eye, which includes the eyelids, the glands around it as a whole unit. We don't think of it just as dry eye. There's so many different conditions. So these are just a range of different conditions that can be classed under ocular surface disease, which is surprising because um, Sjogren's just is one part of that. So dry eye syndrome can include Sjogren's. Dry eye syndrome, uh, sorry, secretarial conjunctivitis, which is a rare condition, can also be found in Sjogren's. Um, you could also get stem cell deficiency in Sjogren's. So Sjogren's is a condition which, um, which is, it, uh, you know, can affect the whole of the body, but in particular with the eyes and the unit around the eyes, it can affect several different components. So dry eye is quite prevalent. So nowadays, post COVID, I'm seeing a lot more patients, um, including those with Sjogren's coming in with deterioration of their dry eye. So we got something called MAID, which is mask associated dry eye. So people who have masks like we do in hospital now, not so much nowadays as compared to a few months ago, but the masks themselves can cause dry eye. But on top of that, it can, can exacerbate dry eye that's already there. So I'm seeing patients who have Sjogren's who've been relatively well controlled, who've developed worsening of their dry eye because of simple environmental changes like that. So dry eye is really a combination of decreased tear production, which is what we call aqueous deficiency, or an abnormal combination of the components of, of, of the tear film. The tear film isn't just water. That's a big misconception. 
there's so many different components. There's anti-inflammatory components, there's protective components, there's mucin, there's uh, lipids, there's oils that are produced by your eyelids. Um, and then there's the tears, which themselves aren't just water. They've got um, a, like a balanced salt solution to them. So they aim to keep the homeostasis, which is what we call the self-regulation of the surface of the eye. So there's so many components of the tear film. It's not just water. So we're not just dealing with adding water to the surface. If you just add water to the surface, actually it will be not so good for the surface of your eye. There's many more things that are needed. That's why we're getting newer and newer lubricants coming out. Uh, and I'll talk to you about those as well. In terms of a simple toolbox for dry eye management. Now, this is what I go through with every patient with dry eye. It doesn't just have to be exclusively for simple dry eye. So just because somebody is suspected to have Sjogren's, I don't just go straight to the top tier of treatment. I need to make sure the standard things or the simple things are managed. This is, for example, blepharitis. We're seeing a lot of patients with blepharitis. I'm going to talk about blepharitis a bit, a little bit later, but essentially it's just inflammation of the eyelids, which results in a poor tear film. It results in inflamed tears. It results in a poor um, kind of uh, balance of the components of the tears. And simple advice could often limit the effect of blepharitis in Sjogren's patients as well. So not just patients who just have blepharitis. VDU, so computers, uh, iPhone phones. Um, we live in a world now where we use computers and phones all the time. If I think to my childhood, I didn't have get a phone till I was about 19 years old when I went to Manchester University. Before then, my parents wouldn't let me have a phone, even though they were out for about two or three years. I don't remember looking at phones or iPads. Um, computers we got into, but computers were, you know, maybe an hour a day or less. Um, we're really changing the way we live now. So we have to appreciate that a lot of dry eye is exacerbated by not blinking. Um, so, you know, even people come in with dry eye who, who don't blink regularly. For example, now when I'm doing this talk, because I'm going to be concentrating, I'm going to be trying to be as um, kind of um, interactive as possible. I won't be blinking as much as I would do if I was just sit, sitting in my garden, having a drink. So the important thing is to make sure blinking is effective um, and also control the screen time. People who are on soft contact lenses, really we need to limit that and optimize the soft contact lens uh, fitting and the type. And there are medications. So again, not everybody with Sjogren's will just be on treatment for Sjogren's. There will also be Sjogren's patients who will have other health problems as well. And these are examples of some treatments that they may be on. So we have to look at, at the body and the patient as a whole. Don't just focus on the fact that somebody's got Sjogren's. Smoking cessation, that's a big, big risk factor. So I see many patients who uh, uh, have stopped smoking and improved in their dry eye management. Um, and obviously, um, when hormonal levels change with time, even with men as well, um, the dry eye can become a more of a factor, even though we find Sjogren's is more common in females above the age of 40. Um, and again, those people have had previous laser surgery. And I've had Sjogren's patients who've only found that they've had Sjogren's after they had laser eye surgery, and they've really, really suffered from their dry eye. Now, looking at Sjogren's and dry eye specifically, there's many, many papers available to read through. And every single paper kind of under, undermines the same thing. It basically emphasizes that there's a significant group of people who have Sjogren's and suffer from dry eye, and management is quite challenging. And then there's a group of patients who never know they have Sjogren's and are being treated in the community with dry eye and never know they have Sjogren's. So we need to bring those two things together and make sure that we're doing the best we can for our patients as a consultant and as somebody who speaks to the community. This is why I do a lot of educational events for GPs, for training doctors and for optometrists and opticians as well. But unfortunately, dry eye affects 95% of patients who have Sjogren's. And unfortunately, one in 10 patients who have significant dry eye, specific dry eye, potentially goes undiagnosed. It's not easy to deal with. Our patients that see me regularly who we just can't find the optimal treatment and they're always searching for that little bit more. And um, it's something that we really could look into the future as to how we could do a real customized approach to patient management for dry eye. So why is dry eye so bothersome? Uh, the tear film is crucial to the well-being of the eye. So if I tried to open my eye and hold that open for more than a couple of minutes, I'll be in pain. I'll be in pain to the point where my eyes will start tearing because I could produce tears. And secondly, I could actually 
simply squeeze against whatever's holding my eyelids open because I, I just won't be able to leave them open. It'll be so unbearable. Now, the reason why tear film is so crucial is because there's some patients who actually have the equivalent symptoms still blinking. So those people who have quite severe dry eye will get those same symptoms um, without having to hold the eyelids open simply because the tear film isn't healthy or effective or the eyelids aren't doing the job that they need to do or they've got inflammation on the surface of the eye or they're not producing the tears that they need. It's just like sandpaper scratching the surface of the eye. So there's three main things that we see and all of you will be aware of this. Fatigue, so chronic fatigue from dry eye. Um, the eyes may be uncomfortable, but not always. So there's two schools, there's two types of patients, pain without stain and stain without pain. So this is our term for when we look at the level of dry eye, there's two main types of patients that we see. So for example, somebody who's got diabetes, the, the surface of the eye isn't as receptive. So the, the sensation on the surface of the eye may not be as receptive. So they may have a lot of dry eye, but may not feel the discomfort but they may have trouble with their vision, they may have blurring of their vision, and they may get fatigue through the day. So it's not always the same for every single patient in every single condition. In terms of dry eye drops, there's many, many dry eye drops. I'm sure all of you know, throughout the world, there's so many dry eye drops that are available. Each one you know, are promoted as having their own unique benefit. Um, I'm gonna go through the basics of dry eye. I'm not gonna talk about every drop that's available simply because it's gonna be different for the country that you're in. Every company, and I've been to quite a few dry conferences in the last few weeks, actually. I went to one in Paris and I went to one in London, which I was presenting in as well. And essentially, you find out from these drug companies or these dry eye companies how many different types of drops they have within their company. And on top of that, how many different companies there are. It's a very competitive market. And each one will be telling um, the, the kind of user what the benefit is of each. But as a kind of baseline, the idea of a lubricant um, is to wash out the inflammatory factors. So basically putting a drop into your eye to basically wash out the irritants that you have and create a new film that your tear film should be doing anyway. So basically it's trying to create a film on the surface that your eyes aren't able to do or your lacrimal gland isn't able to do. Now, there's a big thing about tear osmolarity. Now, this is probably a little bit too detailed, but we judge something called osmolarity, the simplest way of saying that is how salty is the solution. So how salty are your tears? So how, um, how, much, how many components are there within, within your tears that the more salty they are, the more inflamed they may be, and the more poor quality tears you may have. So we go by tear osmolarity, that's the term that you may hear. And the other purpose of lubricants, or most of them, is to create a layer to protect the surface of the eye. Now we've got a new range of drops that have come out that I use very, very often where they contain components which stop the evaporation of tears. So um, this is the purpose of the lipids that you have on your tears that are produced by your um, eyelids. So you have these tiny glands on your eyelids called meibomin glands, and they produce the meibom, which is the oily component. And they basically mix in with your tears and create this um, film that doesn't evaporate too quickly. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later as well. Then we've got kind of other types of teardrops, which are special order teardrops called autologous serum, which they're blood products. So they could either be allergenic or autologous. So they could be from your own body. So from blood products that are from your blood, or they could be made from blood that's been collected in an eye bank. And then you produce this plasma that's put onto the eye. And some of you that are listening may be on these already for your Sjogren's syndrome, uh, for your Sjogren's. So the evidence base behind dry eye drops is very poor actually. So there's no clear evidence or mechanism that we could see of why putting a, a lubricating drop in will work for most people. Um, I've given you some theories as in lubricating action, replacement of missing tear uh, constituents, reduction of the osmolarity, which is the amount of components within the tears, and diluting your inflammatory substances. But we don't actually know exactly why it works in some people and not in others. It does relieve symptoms because we know from anecdotal reports, we know that the effect is quite rapid and dramatic for some people when they start putting drops in, but there really is a lack of clear research comparing one with the other. There are some more trials coming through, which are usually sponsored by the drug companies, but we don't have a, a huge study or clear evidence showing, okay, this lubricant definitely, definitely works and this one doesn't, but there's more coming up in the field. 
In terms of splitting dry hydrops, drops, um, the main thing is really to check if they're preservative free or not. Now, I'm a big, big fan of having drops that are free from preservatives. Anything where you have preservatives, so what preservatives basically are is they allow the companies who make these drops to keep the drop in a, in a, in a bottle or equivalent for a duration of time without having to throw the bottle out every day. So if you have a preservative free um, uh, drop inside a bottle that's not protected, you'll have to throw that bottle away at the end of every day because it won't be able to maintain it, um, its protection. So it'll, it'll, it could potentially harbor bacteria. It could, it could affect the, it could be, have a negative effect. So the new components are the unit dose, which is single strips, or you get bottles which have vacuum containers, which don't allow anything from outside in. And when they release the drops, they don't allow any regurgitate or, or entry back, back into the bottle. So preservative free is really, really crucial for any patient who has moderate to severe dry eye. Even nowadays, I promote it for patients who have simple dry eye, because any preservatives, for example, a, which is a common preservative, boric acid, or all these drops, that are, all these components that you see in preserved dry, dry eye drops, basically when you're using them for a period of time, they could become very irritant on the eye. And actually the dry eye drops don't do what they're meant to do over a period of time. So a lot of companies nowadays promote the fact that preserved to free drops should be used. Now, the next, next subset is what type of lubricant base they have. So you get two main components. You get uh, drops that have sodium hyaluronate, which is a naturally occurring substance, which is very inert. Do you get some patients who are reactive to it still? They make the newer drops nowadays. And then you want to separate from other mellows or carbon-based lubricants, um, the type of lubricant we have. Now, next thing is whether it's a drop, a, a, drop, a gel, or an ointment. And we can split them up quite easily. So these are the ways that we split up the types of dry drops that we have, because there's, there's hundreds. Now, there's many, many different treatments for dry eye, and I won't have time in the short space of, um, in the short talk to go through all of them. But as a summary, there are some medications that are more kind of effective than others, but there's some medications that have more side effects than others. So we always start on a stepwise treatment. So some patients come and tell me, look, I'm starting on the basic things first. Why don't I go straight up to the top level treatment? It's simply because the top level treatment may carry more side effects and there may not be long-term solutions. Sodium hyaluronate is one that I've mentioned already, but sodium hyaluronate is a base as a drop for many other combination drops. So many companies combine sodium hyaluronate with, for example, threolose, ectoin, carbama, dexpanthenol, and all of them have their unique properties that the companies promote. So combination drops can be anti-inflammatory, they can protect the surface, but often they have a base of something such as sodium hyaluronate, which is in different percentages. For example, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, there's many different percentages. And just be aware that they can be preserved and non-preserved, but most of the sodium hyaluronates are non-preserved nowadays. It's um, strongly hy hy hydrophilic, which means it attracts water, so it retains water. Um, it's got a variable viscosity, which means it's got variable um, kind of level of smearing on the surface, and it retains on the surface, so it's able to protect, or, or it takes a, to quite a few blinks for it to disappear, as opposed to just artificial tears, which you just put in and they blink away after a bit of time. In terms of newer classes of drops, we've got some new ones available nowadays, ectoin-based drops, oil emulsion-based drops, um, such as norm. We've got new lipid-based drops, which are pure oil, to uh, perfluorohexyl octane or phospholipids. So there's quite a few new types of drops coming through. And then there's combination drops, where you get our carbon gel with um, sodium hyaluronate. There's so many different drops on the market that it's going to be possible for me to go through every single one, but hopefully this will give you an idea of what different types there are. Now, a lot of you may have heard of cyclosporin. So cyclosporin is a drop that's very different from its oral counterpart. So the cyclosporin suppression by mouth is very, very different from the drop. So many patients of mine are aware about using cyclosporin as a 
very um, kind of treatment when there's a drop. In the UK, it's licensed as iCurvis. You also can get it as an ointment as well. And we usually use it at night time, but I do have patients who use it more than once a day, probably morning as well. Now, this is a long-term anti-inflammatory dry eye drop. It's licensed for dry eye. It takes a few weeks to start to work. It can sting when it goes in. But I have many patients who have very, very good control with a dry eye with this in combination with lubricating drops. And it's one of the few treatments that are officially approved as a medication for dry eye. Um, it, it has its evidence behind it. And it's been used in America for a long time and in Europe for a long time as other, other it's, it's got another branding elsewhere. So this is something that I could talk about. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, but this is just a summary of sarcosporin. It takes a few weeks to start to kick in. But in the meantime, while you're waiting for something such as sarcosporin to kick in, you can look at topical steroid drops. So a lot of people are worried about use of steroid drops in dry eye, but we have to accept the fact that dry eye is inflammatory, especially in a condition such as Sjogren's. Um, you do get inflammation of the tear surface, and you do need to control that uh, inflammation. And the only way to do it sometimes is unfortunately to use steroid drops. And steroid drops carry very uh, carry stigma around them because um, some strong steroid drops can affect the inside of the eye. They can cause a pressure to go up, causing glaucoma. They can cause cataracts if they're used for long enough. And they could cause side effects such as promoting infection. But I use steroids very effectively on the ocular surface to help manage dry eye. And I do have some patients who really do need steroids. There's not, not many other options. And there's different types of steroids available. Obviously, preservative-free would be preferable. There's milder steroids, um, such as hydrocortisone, that don't penetrate the surface of the eye. So they're not theoretically, they don't cause cataracts or glaucoma. And they are very effective, but they need to be initiated and monitored by an ophthalmologist. You, you mustn't have this treatment um, just as a solo treatment. And you also mustn't have this treatment, you know, GPs aren't able to monitor this, can't check the pressure and things. Antibiotics are something that I use very, very often for patients with dry eye. So often in Sjogren's, we don't just see aqueous deficiency, which is a lack of production of the tears. We do see it in combination with inflammation of the tears, uh, inflammation of the eyelids, inflammation of the tears. And sometimes we do need to use antibiotics for two reasons. Number one, for reducing the bacterial load on the surface of the eye because it's not regular, it's not a normal load. And secondly, for its anti-collagenase effect. And what we mean by that is it reduces the inf inflammatory components that cause the surface to be sticky and inflamed. So something such as doxycycline or azithromycin is quite effective as a short term for management, but we just need to be careful in Sjogren's because you can get things such as strictures in the gullet, you can get side effects from them, they can interact with other medications. So again, this is something that should be initiated by a specialist. Punctal plugs are very effective in patients who have dry eye, not least of all in Sjogren's patients. Because in patients who have Sjogren's, there's a lack of production of tears. And if you control the inflammation on the surface of the eye and you put a plug in, so this is called a plug. So a punctal plug is like a grain of rice. I'm sure some of you have had this um, who, who are listening in. But there's four little ducts. There's two on either side that drain the tears into the nose. And those little drainage ducts, this is called a puncture, can be blocked. And some people have them done temporarily or permanent. And basically, it's a useful way of controlling how much tears stay on the surface. If you block off the lower puncture with a punctal plug, you could control the amount that gets drained because the top one will be the only one draining about 20% of the fluid or the tears that you produce. And if you keep the tears on the surface for longer, then theoretically, you could keep the eye much more lubricated. And it works well but it needs to work together with other treatments as well. Now, severe dry eye is something that most of you probably be interested in, um, kind of think uh, of um, uh, eye roll in it, but we do need to, when somebody gets severe dry eye, it does need specialist management. And we do have specialists who just deal with dry eye. For example, at BMEG, we have Miss Rose and Mr. Barry, who have a dedicated dry service where they just deal with ocular surface. And this often needs quite intense management. So patients often spend an hour or two here, all these questionnaires and everything are done. Specialist treatment is involved, such as serum drops, which I've mentioned, mentioned before. But I've had some people who've 
whose lives have completely changed with purely dry eye, um, where they've been able to lead a relatively normal life with these scleral lenses. Adjunctive treatment, so I'm coming up towards the end of my talk now. We could only, we could only talk about adjunctive treatments. These are treatments that you hear about online. You may get offered in a private clinic or on the NHS. Um, the main concern here is, is that often they're not solo treatments. They need to be combined with other treatments. They're not gimmicks. I wouldn't call them gimmicks, but they are treatments that have evidence behind them, but they're not a one-stop solution. So I'm gonna give you examples of this. For example, um, there's one that we use in our private clinic called um, Tixel treatment, which is just like a heat treatment that, that I'll show you what it looks like. Um, it's just like these little pyramids um, that are heated up to 400 degrees. And then there's a little activation device that just basically works on the eyelids. It doesn't go anywhere near the eye. It just works on the eyelids all the way around. And originally it was developed as a dermatology uh, product, but they found that, derma that patients who had skin lesions or scars around their face or wrinkles around their face, their dry eye tend had improved. So then there's more evidence behind it as a dry eye treatment. The theory behind it is when you create localized heat that isn't damaging to the skin, you get a reactive process that allows anti-inflammation. So it, it fights inflammation. So this in turn affects a dry eye. So I, I've had many people who've had this, who've had a very positive result, but almost universally, all of them still need to be on dry eye drops, still need to be on icurvis or cyclosporin or everything else. It's just that they feel they got that extra benefit from it. It's very rarely something that works on its own. So going back to IPL, which I've, um, um, IPL is intense pulse light. Again, it's mainly effective for inflammatory dry eye, which yes, a lot of Sjogren's patients have this, traditionally for inflammation of the eyelids, but it also does a, is effective in other forms of dry eye as well. IPL is not laser, okay? Laser is a monochromatic um, light. So it's a single beam of light, which is really intense. This is a polychromatic light. So it's a multiple um, layered light, which is not acting on one wavelength. It's non-coherent, so it doesn't focus into one area, but it does get absorbed by the hemoglobin and the fine vessels on the skin, and it causes contraction, and it causes coagulation in those fine vessels that cause inflammation. And that's how it's theoretically, that's how it works. And there is plenty of evidence behind it. But again, with Sjogren's patients, it can be used as an adjunct, but not as a treatment on its own. So coming up to was the end of the talk, um, there's these several treatments that some of you in other countries may have heard of, such as Zitra, uh, Lacupep. Um, they're all going through their clinical trials. Some of them have been withdrawn because they're not as effective. But there are things that are coming out in the market. Um, and there are things that will particularly be aimed at specific types of dry eye. There's all these proteins that we find on the surface that may be lacking in particular conditions. So what they're trying to work on is the genetic basis of this and also the the way of replacing these components without replacing everything else, if you see what I mean. So there's loads of things in the pipeline. And what should we know, or what should me, like me as a consultant or a, a specialist tell the patient? Now, what I often tell patients is that ocular surface disease is common. It's very common. Like 80% of my patients who come to see me, regardless of whether they're dry or not, actually have got ocular surface disease. Each patient is unique and individual. It's fine to group patients into certain conditions such as Sjogren's, but I guarantee you every single Sjogren's patient will have different type of dry or different kind of level of dry eye, or will respond to different treatments differently. And the majority are treatable within the community setting. Not all of us will have to send patients towards the super specialist dry clinic, even though some of you will be. And lubricants alone do not cure the condition, but they control the condition. There may be an element of trial and error. We get some patients who like one lubricant over another and we never know why. And we mustn't forget that lifestyle and environmental factors are very important. We mustn't forget that. So just because we get a drop that we think would help us, we mustn't forget about the lifestyle factors that could help us. Thank you for listening. I hope I didn't overrun too much. Um, but this final slide just tells you that often my and your journey in the dry eye is often a long road. It's not something that's something that will be just by cul-de-sac that you just end. There's always some things that we could do and there's always newer things that are coming out. So please don't feel disillusioned by not responding to one.
think we're all free. There's always things that are available. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now we can uh, we can uh, we can uh, go on with the questions and answers. Um, so uh, someone you already answered somehow, but someone asked asks if it's imperative or not to use preservative free eye drops, which are more costly as they come in individual capsules. Yeah, so preserved drops are quite um, irritant to the eye. You, basically the preservatives in these drops, I mean, some preservative free drops are not truly preservative free. That's something I didn't mention in my talk. This, there's guidelines, uh, there's industry guidelines of what constitutes preservative free. So you will find some companies actually put a tiny amount of preservative in that doesn't quite reach the minimum threshold. And that means that they qualify as being preservative free. So I get patients coming back saying, well, I'm using this new drop and it says preservative free, but I'm still irritant to it. So some people are actually sensitive to preservatives. My basic premise is that if you're using a drop regularly every day, more than two or three times a day, you're constantly putting preservatives in. So initially you might find relief, but over a longer period of time, you will get the cumulative effect of these preservatives. And actually it will have an adverse effect on you long-term. So my feeling is always really, I think it's definitely worthwhile going down the preservative free route if you can. I know they're more expensive, but the costs are coming down. Um, but I would highly kind of agree with the, the, the theory that preservative free is better. Yeah, so preservative free eye drops are a must for us. Uh, someone uh, asked uh, a question about uh, placanil. Uh, yeah. For those people, uh, for the people who use uh, placanil, could you recommend uh, which eye tests are required yeah. for annual screening? So, yeah, that, that's a very good question. So, if any of you don't know, this is called hydroxychloroquine. There's different variations of that, and it's used for conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, for Sjogren's, for any autoimmune uh, uh, issue. So hydroxychloroquine is something that we we see patients on a lot. The issue with it is it needs to be well controlled in terms of dosage and in terms of cumulative use. So when you take hydroxychloroquine, every dose you take has a cumulative effect over time. So there's a maximum dose you can have over a long period of time, which you don't really want to go over. That's why you need to be under a rheumatologist or a specialist. Now, the reason for a baseline test is to make sure you haven't got any underlying problems with your macula, which is the back of your eye. So I'm a specialist in the front of the eye, so I don't do the screening myself, but the Royal College guidelines and the AAO have guidelines on this. The reason for that is that once the damage has been done, it's already done, it's not reversible. So the purpose of screening every six months or a year is to identify these issues before they become too damaging to the retina or the macula. So things such as autofluorescence testing, which is a scan of the back of the eye, things such as microperimetry, which is checking for subtle defects on the macula, those are very effective at detecting early signs of toxicity of the back of the eye. Now, if your, rheumato your rheumatologist is starting this treatment, they'll be very sensible in terms of the dosage. It's those people who have higher dosage who can get this. It's still very rare. Don't worry about it. If you're on it, don't, please don't think of stopping it just because of this. But it's something that you really should have regular eye tests for, are they six monthly to yearly? And it's not just a case of how. Big thing. There's programs in every country of how the, the Royal College or the Optometry Association or the Ophthalmology Association will deal with this. And rheumatologists also have guidelines as well. I probably direct you towards the American Association of Ophthalmology and Royal College of Ophthalmologists. They have guidelines online. You could read them and see what the exact tests are if you're interested in that. But yes, uh, you know, it's a very effective treatment and it works very well, but it's something that needs monitoring like anything else. Yeah, the same person asks if uh, it's mandatory to 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 visit an ophthalmologist of in uh, if or if uh, an optician is enough. You have already answered that, but I think it's very important to underline it. Yeah, but, yeah. The, 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 there's some specialist optometrists who actually deal with this and do the screening programs. 
So you just have to make sure that the optometrist, ophthalmologist, or anyone who you see is actually regulated or enabled to be able to screen for this. They need to have the equipment, number one, and they need to be able to interpret the results. It's just not just taking, just because they've got a fancy piece of equipment in the department, it doesn't mean they can interpret the, the images. So, and it's ideal, a specialist optometrist is ideal. Some of them are part of a screening program because this is a national screening program. It's anyone who's on it should really be in that program for a long period of time. That's when you get close to the threshold dose, when it's when, when you, you know, your reproductive might think about something else or lowering the dose. So, yes, there is some, some evidence behind that longer so term. We, we need to, to visit a ophthalmologist when we yeah. have shoot. Yeah. It's Monday yeah. for us. Uh, someone is asking a question about uh, pollen because yeah. uh, she has uh, uh, eyes uh, which are more irritable uh, yeah. when there is a, a lot of pollen and she uses uh, antihistamines and she wonders if it makes uh, her eyes uh, more dry or not. Yeah. That's a really, really good question. So I have this problem um, many times in clinic when we have patients who have issues with dry eye, but then when they use an over-the-counter antihistamine, orally or topically, it creates a drying effect. So the purpose of antihistamines is to reduce the histamine load on the surface or fight, or there's something else called a mast cell stabilizer, which controls the amount of response to the pollen. Um, the two ways of controlling the effect of pollen is number one, to kind of check the pollen count before we go out and take the appropriate measures. Uh, lubricants work very well to wash out the effect of the pollen. Um, there's some antihistamines or mast cell stabilizers that are preservative-free. There's one that we have in the UK called ketotophen, which is called ketofol, which is preservative-free. So basically, it doesn't add any preservatives on the eye, and it has the minimum, minimal amount of drying effect on the surface of the eye. So that is an example of something that I'd use in somebody who's got established dry eye already. The other thing is an anti inflammatory effect as well. So those of people who are on icurvis or some other equivalent drop may automatically have a response against pollen uh, irritation because many patients with pollen sensitivities may also be on these treatments such as steroid drops as well. The main thing is to protect your eyes so wear effective shields when you're out and try and avoid, obviously I'm saying obvious rubbing your eyes. All antihistamines are very good. There's specific ones that work very well in addition to others that don't have the drowsy effect, but there are newer preservative free ones available, which are very effective as well. But don't forget to use the lubricants to wash out these irritants and break the cycle of rubbing or itching. Okay. And you. when you're in the, sorry, when you're in the car, or when you're in an environment where you could block the outside, there's some, filters that you have where like HEPA filters where you don't allow pollen to get in so for example when you're in the car you use the recirculation mode so simple lifestyle changes that could make to limit the amount of pollen exposure you have thank you for, for this uh, very clear answer and uh, the advice is uh, another question uh, is there a program to monitor patients uh, who take uh, hydroxy Chlorokine uh, for five years or more in uh, your area in Birmingham. Yeah. So yeah. Um, this is a, quite a, um, a debate, a moot question, because um, there's a screening program that every every rheumatologist who initiates hydroxychloroquine needs to have access to a, a screening program. The reason for the, I think the reason why you're asking about five years or more is because that's when hydroxychloroquine, when somebody's been on hydroxychloroquine for a fair bit of time, they reach the maximum dose over a certain amount of time. And that's when the rheumatologist might be thinking of an alternative treatment or reducing the dose slightly because it's all about cumulative effect. But yes, anyone who's been on it for five years or more should really, if they haven't been already, should really have their eyes checked because you want to check for toxicity of the macula. Some patients also have coexisting eyes problems such as macular degeneration which is something that can be there so you just need to be careful about those kind of coexisting conditions so my recommendation is if if you in specific haven't had this or you're not attached to a program ask your gp about referring you in or ask your optician about referring you in to have this or even your rheumatologist to have, have the check for the back of the eye okay it's specifically the back of the eye hydroxychloroquine can have a 
effect elsewhere, rest of the body, but in specific with the eyes and macula that's affected. So you get something called bullseye maculopathy and you get these early changes um, that don't get spotted straight away. By the time it causes the change that's visible, it's already too late, you can't reverse it, you see. I hope that's answered the question. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. Uh, first, as a person, uh, thanks you very much for the informative talk. And uh, this person also asked, uh, is there any evidence for the benefit of omega-3 supplementation for dry eyes? That's a really good question. It's very topical because at the moment, we're debating whether omega-3 is useful. So the thing about omega-3 is in the past, we had certain scarce stories about whether it affects the prostate, whether it should be recommended males. This was a few years ago. Nowadays, there's new research just come out in the last few weeks where it says that it's questionable benefit. Um, I personally see patients who are on omega-3 who swear by the improvement, um, but I don't actively promote it anymore. I don't tell patients, every patient I see you must be on omega-3. What I do promote is vitamin D. We see many patients with vitamin D deficiency, especially in the UK. Um, the thing about vitamin D is it's interesting because um, it, it, during the COVID period, we were recommending vitamin D to everyone. Even I, when I had COVID, I, I took vitamin D in, in abundance. The thing about vitamin D is in a climate such as one we live in is but if we're working during the day and we're going out in the sun, for example, now, we won't get much vitamin D because we're not exposing our long bones and the sun isn't high enough to have enough for effect to give us vitamin D or create enough vitamin D. So we're living in a climate which we're not constantly wearing tank tops and we're not constantly exposing our bone, long bones. So we naturally have a population, especially in the ethnic minorities, where we may not be getting enough vitamin D. So Nowadays, I'm going more towards the effect of vitamin D deficiency, which I think definitely has a role in dry eye. So omega-3, not so much anymore. There are patients who take omega-3. I don't tell them to stop it, and particularly if, if they take it. But at the same time, I'm not promoting it. I've not been promoting it for a while now. Um, omega-3, the idea behind it is because it's a fish oil, because it's um, the, three, the four vitamins that are fat-soluble, A, D, E, K, those are promoted when you use fish oils, it all helps with the lipid component of the dry eye, so and then anti-inflammatory components. So, you know, there's no harm in taking it, I don't think, but I don't think there's a clear evidence base behind it at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, uh, another question. I'm often advised to use compresses for my eyes in addition to yeah. eye drops and the other treatments, but sometimes I'm advised cold compresses, sometimes yeah. hot sometimes with tea and uh, i wonder yeah. i wonder is it really useful and which one to, to to use that's a really really good question because we often see patients with chagrins um don't necessarily have um because the misconception is that chagrins is only linked to lack of production of tears but actually the tears that are produced are often very inflamed and when you get inflamed tears, often the eyelids become inflamed and you get a very bad blepharitis. That's probably why people use um, hot and warm compresses. Now, compresses are very good, but they need to heat the eyelids up to a specific temperature, which is around about 40, 39 to 41 degrees. Anything above or below that really won't liquefy the glands that are blocked with the oils, the maven. So that's why you get these specific masks that you put in the microwave way that heat it up to a specific amount and don't go any more or any less and you put them over the closed light lids and they're very effective now some people find cooling the cooling effect on the eye is very soothing for the eye so that's not treating your mabum glands that's not treating your oils it's more giving you a soothing effect that cooling effect for anything when i do lasers when i do any uh, kind of treatment on the surface i like the cool i don't want warm i want cool because it has a, a kind of a, a, a kind of anti-inflammatory or heat uh, dissipating effect. Same thing when you're told to use cool compressors, is really to give your eye that cooling effect from any lubricants that you're using as well. When you use warm compressors, you're basically trying to open up the block glands that you have on the edge of your eyelid. And yes, there's plenty of benefit. There's plenty of evidence behind them. And at the end of it, when you use lid wipes, such as um, some speci special lid wipes, and you wipe that debris away that gets collected, you're basically clearing the base of the eyelashes to stop them from getting accumulated. Tea tree oil is very, very irritant to the eye. And some people believe firmly against it because it does cause irritation. 
there are some products available with a very minimal amount of tea tree. Um, my thinking is, is that the only benefit of tea tree is to treat something called Demodex, which some people have, but I would basically deal with very simple lid wipes, even makeup room pad removers that are soaked in boiled water that's cooled down. After you've done the heat treatment, you just wipe it away. I wouldn't go as far as to recommend tea tree for everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, is it safe to use a heated masks uh, with dry eye and glaucoma? So the reason for that question is potentially um, with dry eye, there's some patients who have dry eye where the top layer is loose. So you have this thing called recurrent erosion, which is where the top layer keeps ripping off. I tend to avoid heat masks in those types of patients because when you heat up the closed eyelid, basically you, you almost can loosen the top layer. So you have to be very careful not to do that. So there's some select few patients where I wouldn't recommend a heat mask. Um, and if you do use a heat mask, use a special one that isn't too hot or too cold. It heats up to a certain temperature, like the one I'm mentioning. There's some ones with special seeds like grape seed extracts where it doesn't allow the mask to go above a certain temperature. In glaucoma, there's some, as long as you're not using it at the same time as your drops, glaucoma drops, it's fine. If you've had previous glaucoma surgery, again, I'd ask a glaucoma specialist before using a heat mask, because some people have spe specific little blebs or little bumps on the surface of the eye, which is draining the fluid. I wouldn't say there's a strict um, contraindication to using that, but I would say that it'll be worth asking a glaucoma specialist if you've had previous glaucoma surgery before going ahead with the heat mask. You might be just fine with the lid wipes. Unfortunately, a lot of glaucoma patients have dry eye and have blepharitis and have inflamed eyelids. So unfortunately, it is part and parcel of some patients with glaucoma. Okay, thank you. So I don't have uh, any other questions. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for this very informative talk. Uh, I also thank uh, uh, my uh, colleagues of uh, Tribune Europe uh, who helped uh, me to organize uh, this uh, this webinar, especially uh, Linda and uh, Cathy for the technical. And I give uh, I let uh, Linda uh, give uh, speak the last words for this uh, webinar. Well, I want to thank you very much, Anka, because I think you've taken us a lot further than most of us kind of expected uh, and you've answered the questions um, freely and again with with enormous inf practical information for all of us that I'm sure will help people going forward. So thank you very much for your time here this evening. It's much appreciated and I thank you on behalf of my colleagues and on behalf of those people who suffer with Sjogren's disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you See very you much. Everyone. Yep. See Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.